All right. Next, uh, in domain one, security and risk management, we're going to talk about a complete and effective security program, uh, meaning what are the elements that we need to incorporate into our security program to make sure that it is successful, right? Oversight is a huge element to this, right? Oversight uh, is a way for us to evaluate the security program and to ensure that the security program is meeting our organizational goals and defined goals. Several different groups can be involved in this oversight, the HR department, right? Identifying uh, the code of conduct for individuals, uh, you know, uh, based on you know, an employee handbook or onboarding or offboarding employees. Uh, what are the determination policies? What are the disciplinary policies for the organization? How many of how many times have those policies have had to be enacted? What are deviations from those policies and so on? Of course, legal is always going to be involved, uh, making sure that the policies that we do implement uh, are enforceable. Uh, and we're not going to open ourselves up to litigation based on, uh, you know, uh, a wrongful termination or whatever it might be. Make sure that we're following all the local, state, and federal laws that are required as a business entity or a business unit. Uh, the IT department, obviously going to be much more involved in providing technical input uh, based on the initiatives and the goals uh, to support the policies that we're putting in place, which... In, in most cases, when it does come to security, uh, policies that are going to be implemented across the board are going to require the use of some sort of technology. Uh, we have to identify compliance based on ethics that are defined. What are our contractual obligations to our customers or to our partners or relationships? Uh, what what uh, types of investigative uh, steps are we taking to help us establish uh, the policies and to create those policies and so on. So the oversight community is typically going to be comprised of management level employees. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say executive level employees, but certainly uh, employees that fill a leadership role within the organization. There is typically no direct relationship between an oversight uh, committee and the security department. The reason uh, is twofold. Number one, uh, oversight committees are often uh, 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 manned or employed by non-technical individuals uh, that are looking to see that just certain tick boxes are checked and so on. But also we want to have that separation from the security department. We don't want any uh, uh, cross-contamination of beliefs or uh, uh, institutional, uh, uh, you know, concepts, uh, whatnot that might apply to security so that we're making sure that the oversight committee is completely separate and not influenced by uh, individuals that are responsible for implementing the security policy. The value of the committee is to provide business direction, uh, aware, awareness of the security activities that are, are being uh, utilized with the organization and the impactfulness of those security activities to the organization. Oftentimes, uh, through regulatory compliance, oversight has to be done by a third party. Uh, a perfect example, my, I, I'm using my son's school as an example again because we just had uh, the summer or spring carnival at his school, um, you know, and uh, had carnival rides and and a boardwalk with you know uh, you know games and uh, booth games and so on, all kinds of you know cool carnival stuff. Uh, but uh, I was one of the the parent volunteers and setting up some of the uh, you know techno you know technology and whatnot and and uh, uh, you know manly stuff type of stuff you know, but. Throughout the entire four-hour event, there was a fire marshal walking around, looking at everything uh, and uh, making note or making uh, demands on changes based on uh, maintaining fire code and, and whatnot. Um, and that, that would be an example, uh, uh, you know, not security related, more life safety related, but an example of 
uh, an oversight that was required based on the permit was required in order for the policy to be, uh, you know, for the appropriate life safety policies to be in place. All right. Um, so the idea is that uh, oversight provides that. What is a vision statement versus a mission statement? A mission statement, by definition, defines the company's uh, business, uh, essentially business objectives, uh, and how it's going to achieve those objectives. Whether it's a sales organization, uh, a technology company, a services-related company, or whatever, the mission statement is directly related to where where do we need to be right now to be able to provide those services to our clients. A vision statement is where we want to be in the future, right? Where do we want to grow this business to? How, how you know, what kind of uh, uh, global reach do we want to have for this organization? Or what is the long-term goal of this organization from a services standpoint, from a sales standpoint, etc.? And that defines the vision or the future of the organization. So in the end, incorporating new technology, uh, looking at different business sectors, having different partner relationships, uh, having uh, you know different uh, subject matter experts in the organization are going to be driven by these the, a combination of these two statements. Uh, however, that doesn't necessarily mean that these statements uh, that are defined have security in mind. And it is your goal as a security officer to incorporate security into these objectives, not necessarily written into the mission statement, right? Unless you're specifically a security organization, you might de not define security as an element of your mission statement or your vision statement. However, we know that missions and visions can be somewhat broad uh, and the goals are counterproductive to security. Uh, you know, we always hear about people cutting corners and whatnot to ensure that they meet their financial uh, uh, goals. Uh, and that includes, uh, you know, not, in, uh, not implementing specific security elements. All right. So a security council vision statement should uh, certainly reference the mission and vision statement of the organization, but it should be focused on security concepts of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Very high level, to the point, and most importantly, achievable goals. Achievable goals. That's a very, very important aspect. Uh, the mission statement is, of course, the statement of objectives that support the overall vision, not only where we are today, but where we want to be, but it provides the roadmap for achieving that vision. Uh, and, and it is uh, typically non-technical. I would say, yeah, it does communicate to technical individuals, but in a non-technical way. Uh, and uh, these statements should be reviewed on an annual basis or whenever there's a significant change to the organization, including the security aspects, of course. Security program oversight uh, provides input. Uh, and uh, allows us to identify the overall direction of the security program based on that input. We can decide on what types of projects we're going to implement now as opposed to the projects that we can implement later on based on the likelihood and impact of different threats in the threat landscape to our organization. Uh, and we need to understand implementing this project uh, while delaying this other project, what the impact of that is to the organization as well. All right. Obviously, the goal for program oversight is to prioritize information security efforts to understand and project the initiatives and impact of those initiatives and to prioritize the projects. But oversight is more than that, right? Oversight also includes the ability to measure uh, the effectiveness of the programs. Uh, so we can look at our policies. We can, we can kind of do a general you know, review of the policies and see if generally those policies are meeting our objectives. We can do a line by line review of policies. So if we identify from a general perspective 
this policy doesn't seem to address concerns A, B, or C. Now we can do a line-by-line -line analysis and find out why A, B, and C are not being addressed by that particular policy. Uh, but we need to make sure that we're monitoring, actively monitoring, we see this over and over again, actively monitoring the security implementation plan, make sure that we meet the policies, the standards, the baselines that we have in place uh, uh, to, um, uh, you know, to ensure that we're meeting our objective. All right, does that make sense? All right. Oops, switch the slide here. Hold on, there we go. Uh, the oversight uh, should also include reviews, uh, uh, you know, defined reviews uh, based on our security program. Uh, oftentimes we do like to have independent third parties come in and review the effectiveness of the program because they're gonna be less likely to be influenced by the fact that they may or may not have their job uh, or uh, you know that they don't wanna throw anybody under the bus, so to speak, or whatnot. Um, so having third party auditors that don't have really any, any attachment to the organization can be a good way of, of reviewing the effectiveness of an overall security program. Uh, you also need to have champions within the organization. This is a really, really important point. This, is, this, this goes back to the concept that we discussed previously, which is the concept of culture. If you don't get buy-ins from executives on the uh, concepts of security, uh, particularly why security is important and why these things are important to implement within our organization, then it's not gonna be a very effective program. So you have to have uh, not only uh, a, an individual that champions the, uh, the organizational process, uh, but you also have to have buy-in from executives. Uh, now it does say here the council understands and accepts policies and then the committee champions the policy, uh, meaning that they're the ones that are kind of promoting this policy as, as important. But the extent, uh, to extend this, this concept of champions, uh, it's important that the organization, that the leaders in the organization have a similar view uh, of the importance of security and they are also spearheading uh, these, uh, uh, you know, these goals and objectives uh, because ultimately uh, that's going to determine what the overall culture is within the organization. Uh, as a uh, part of the oversight, uh, you, you're going to recommend uh, different investment strategies uh, based on your business unit to, uh, to promote uh, the funds or, or at least to, to allocate the funds that are necessary for you to achieve your individual goals. Uh, and uh, the, those budgetary considerations go up to review for the CFO or the CEO of the organization to ensure that the budgets are being applied appropriately. Uh, based on everything that we've been talking about, okay? Now, we are going to spend a lot of time in this section. We, I kind of scanned through the slides during the break just to kind of see what we've got left uh, in this particular uh, um, slide deck, and uh, or this domain, I should say. And uh, one of the things that we're going to spend a lot of time discussing are frameworks. Uh, now, frameworks or control frameworks are... Uh, in essence, guidelines that an organization can use uh, to build their security architecture. Uh, sometimes these frameworks are mandatory, sometimes they're voluntary. It depends on the organization. But regardless of whatever framework that you decide to incorporate into your organization's security architecture, the frameworks have to be consistent, meaning that if I apply this framework to company A, and I apply the framework, the same framework to company B, it should generally result in the same outcome. All right? Uh, you know, meaning that uh, it's not customized, it's not unique to a particular organization. That's why frameworks tend to be somewhat general and not really specific. 
we'll see that as we start to analyze different frameworks. You're going to see a consistent uh, structure to these frameworks where they all kind of look and sound the same. It has to be measurable. Uh, there has to be a way uh, for us to define metrics within the framework, measurable metrics within the framework to make sure that we're adhering to uh, the standard. Uh, so it has to be, there has to be a way for us to uh, evaluate and assess the application of the framework to the organization so that we can make changes as necessary. It needs to be standardized. Uh, standardized meaning it relies on standardization for expected results. It's kind of similar to consistent, meaning that there's only one way to implement the framework. It's not open to interpretation. Uh, starting point A, this is the first step. Starting point B, this is the first step. Starting point C, this is the first step. So uh, that has to be, uh, that's what they really define as standardized. It has to be comprehensive. Uh, you know, it needs to include all aspects of control. Uh, it, it has to have a robust assessment component. Uh, it has to have a robust um, asset management component, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You'll see that as we go through these different frameworks a little bit later on. And it needs to be modular, meaning that uh, if I make a change within the organization, a, a small change in the organization is not going to result in a completely uh, the need for a completely new framework, so to speak. Uh, and uh, so what I what I mean by that is that um, it's kind of like the OSI model is modular in design. If I change from IPv4 to IPv6, I'm changing the network layer, but I don't have to relearn, uh, you know, how the data link layer works or the application layer works and so on, because I've only changed one small component of the overall architecture. Everything else still works the same. Same would apply here to the framework that we're applying to our organization. Here's an example of a uh, framework, 800-53. Uh, now, I used to tell my students, uh, you know, all, all the time um, that uh, you really need to know these particular frameworks, like, like the back of your hand. Uh, and um, NIST uh, is one of... Uh, you know, kind of those standard frameworks that we have uh, in place. It's a, a set of controls um, uh, that we would use to, to, for compliance, um, to be able to uh, monitor compliance within the organization. Uh, now, you do not need to know what's listed on uh, in this document per se. This is just an example um, of, uh, uh, you know, kind of a representation of the different categories, right? But let's talk a little bit about this framework. It's not the goal of this particular slide. Uh, the, the goal of this particular slide is just to kind of introduce the concept of a framework, but I think it's important to mention since we're already on the slide here. Uh, NIST, um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, special publication uh, 853 provides uh, essentially a catalog of security and privacy controls, and this is what would potentially be on the exam, for U.S. federal information in, uh, uh, systems, specifically for U.S. federal information systems, uh, except uh, the ones that are excluded are the ones that are related directly to uh, national security. Uh, like I said, it is published by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, this is a non-regulatory agency, by the way. Uh, it's actually part of the U.S. Department of, um, uh, United States Department of Commerce. Uh, but the, the goal of this special publication is to develop and issue standards and guidelines uh, and sub-publications or other publications to essentially help federal agencies 
uh, to an actor implement something called FISMA, F-I-S-M-A, the Federal Information Security Modernization Act, which came out in, oh gosh, 2014, I think. Um, and, uh, and it outlines different programs or, or different uh, goals to, perfect, uh, to protect the information uh, systems. Uh, now, there are two related documents to uh, this special publication, 5, uh, uh, 853A uh, and 853B. Uh, and then there, uh, the baseline standard, of course, is 853. Uh, it, it is part of the overall special publication 800 series. Um, and we don't need to get into the specifics, but... It, it is what we would define as a risk management framework, or RMF. Uh, it actually covers the steps in a risk management framework to uh, identify and uh, address different security control selection for federal information systems. Uh, and, uh, and it's basically in accordance to a FIPS standard. A lot of different acronyms, a lot of different... Uh, kind of individual components that we talk about here. FIPS is the Federal Information Processing Standard. Uh, you know, what are the uh, initial set of baseline security controls? Uh, what is, uh, you know, how do I define worst case impact uh, analysis? Uh, how do I tailor those baseline security controls and supplement the security controls based on uh, the organizational's uh, risk appetite or their acceptance or, or assessment of risk in the organization. So we, there are 18 areas uh, that are covered uh, in this uh, um, section or in this special publication, I should say. Access control, which is the AC. Um, incident response, IR. Uh, business continuity, uh, BC. Uh, disaster recovery. You can see, I'm not going to read all of these, but you can see those different uh, areas that are, that are part of the publication. Uh, agencies uh, that work with federal, the federal government are expected to be compliant with these NIST security standards and guidelines uh, within the, a year of when the, the publication is released. So it, these are directives. Uh, and even though this is a framework, it's not generally a recommended framework, it's a required framework. Uh, and, um, you know, so it's, it's, you know, if you want to do business with the federal government, you have to meet these requirements. See, and it came out originally in 2005. Uh, there was another revision in 2006. Uh, and, um, and then uh, uh, in 2007, there was another revision as well. Uh, I think they're up to um, the fifth or sixth revision. I, I know it's at least the fifth. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a sixth revision yet or not. Um, the, you know, we don't need to know this. You know, the special, specific uh, revisions and what they included. Uh, but I will mention um, uh, specifically when the 18 control families were included. That was in revision four. Uh, and I think that came out in 2012 or 13. Don't quote me on these dates because I, I would have to look them up to be 100% sure, but um, at least in the ballpark, right? Uh, you know, but we're gonna focus on things like insider threats to the organization software uh, application security, uh, developing applications, even including web applications, social networking, uh, mobile devices, data mobility and cloud computing, uh, advanced persistent threats, supply chain considerations, privacy considerations, and so on. So uh, revision four is where we first saw the 18 control families uh, broken up. Uh, and then uh, in revision five, uh, I think they made some minor changes to the verbiage uh, and, and, you know, had some clarification on, you know, interaction between organizations and affiliates and so on. 
Uh, and that came out in uh, in 2020, so fairly recently. Um, and they're mentioning specifically on this slide, revision four. That's what the R4 stand, stands for. 285 different controls. Now, what does this mean? Technical operational management. Uh, it defines the class of control. And we're going to get into this in more detail later on. But the class of control is... Are we using technology to implement that control? Is it a policy, procedure, or a guideline that we're uh, uh, documenting? That would be an operational control. Uh, or is it, you know, some function of management, right? Security assessments and, and security authorization would be like a sign-off on subject matter experts and, and management. So you can see that essentially we have different classes of controls within NIST 853. All right. Uh, and uh, yeah, so revision five, it is on the, uh, uh, on the slide here. Revision five, September of uh, 2020. Okay. Now, uh, the 18 categories, you can see we're kind of going through different, uh, the different control frameworks. Um, if you look at the NIST cybersecurity framework, you're going to see similarities between what we have in this NIST special publication, Revision 5, and the NIST cybersecurity framework crosswalk, uh, which would apply to um, the special publication as well as other uh publications as well, uh, what we call the Cyber Resilience Re Review. All right. Hold on one second. But if you look at this, you look at the key elements here. ID, right? So if we go back and look at those 18 different categories, each of these 18 categories kind of fall under these, these different, uh, this different framework. I mentioned Cyber Resilience Review. That's something else related to the Department of Homeland Security, which we might talk about a little bit later on. But um, we'll focus on uh, Special Publication 853 right now. So identify, right? Identify the assets within the organization. Identify the business environment that we're oper operating in. Identify how we apply governance. Uh, 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 completing a risk assessment. Identifying risks within the organization identify our risk management strategy, and identify how we're going to manage our supply chain risk in, uh, in, uh, within the framework. Protect. This is, so if we go back to that kind of uh, the, the what, the how, and, and the implementation, right? The strategic uh, review versus technical review versus operational or, or deployment. Uh, we're talking about with the identify kind of not really strategy, but I mean, it could incorporate some strategic elements, but also technical planning, right? Protect is the actual implementation. We're going to implement access control. We're going to have awareness and training events. We're going to uh, apply data security. That would be things like confidentiality, encryption, etc. cetera. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, apply information protection processes and procedures. Uh, we're going to have maintenance for the security organization. We're going to have protective technology like IDSs and IPSs and so on. We need to also have detection capabilities. How do we identify anomalies or breaches from our baseline security uh, um, definitions? How do we provide for continuous monitoring? What is the overall detection process that we're using? How do we respond to events, right? We have a CERT team or, or a CERT, I should say, um, you know, computer incident response uh, team. Uh, uh, you know, we have various entities that are, uh, you know, we have a playlist, if you will, or a playbook, I should say, that identifies how we're supposed to respond to incidents and so on. So response planning, what is our communications plan? How do we analyze uh, uh, you know, the event, right, to be able to identify affected systems, identify, uh, you know, various aspects of, of uh, the, the breach or whatever it might be that we're responding to. 
How can we mitigate that in the future? Uh, and how can we make improvements, what we call lessons learned, right? And then recovery, how do we recover from the incident, right? Uh, recovery planning, uh, improvements to the overall process, and communication. So, uh, again, you, you know, you look at these, they're not going to be uh, ask you on the test, uh, what are the five elements of the NIST cybersecurity framework crosswalk, right? In other words, how can I, how are each of these different uh, controls categorized? Uh, but it kind of makes sense. And you're going to see this more and more as we go through, um, you know, each of these topics. You're going to see more and more how these, um, uh, there's a lot of commonality between these different different frameworks, okay? All right. Uh, CRR, I mentioned that briefly at the beginning of this slide, Cyber Resilience Review, uh, completely voluntary. Uh, it was uh, developed by the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, it's a way for an organization to examine their uh, cybersecurity practices uh, it is offered at no cost by the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and, uh, well, I would say to state, local, uh, territorial uh, areas, tri tribal areas and whatnot. Uh, it is a service-oriented action. Uh, so one of the, the founding principles uh, is that the organization uh, implements its assets and again, assets do not necessarily mean computers. It could be people, it could be technology, it could be facilities, etc., to support their operational mission. Uh, and then the CRR is offered to facilitate workshops for uh, uh, and, and workshop formats uh, as a kind of a self-assessment package, if you will. So it's kind of a, a kind of it's a voluntary thing. It takes about six to eight hours to complete uh, once you have the framework in place to go through the CRR, and then uh, uh, it's something that you do through the guidance of the Department of Homeland Security. But you do it internally. Uh, all that information that you collect through the workshop is um, in the CRR is obviously protected, um, and uh, that information. Uh, is you cannot do a, a, a FOIA request for that information. So it's protected under the Freedom of Information Act request or from, I should say, the Freedom of uh, Information Act request. Uh, it cannot be used in civil litigation um, or in any, tor any kind of regulatory, for any regulatory purpose. It's entirely voluntary, all right? Um, I don't know that you need to know much about it for the uh, exam. Uh, but it is something that, um, uh, you know, they do love to kind of ask about different acronyms on the test. So you may see uh, a reference to CRR at some point. All right. Um, the questions that are asked in the CRR uh, and uh, the, re the report that gets generated from the result of the program uh, result in the overall assessment. Uh, the DHS has actually partnered with uh, the CERT division of uh, Carnegie Mellon University and uh, the Software Engineering Institute uh, to design and deploy the CRR information. Uh, and then the goals are delivered through what we call the CERT Resilience Management Model uh, or CERT RMM. You see a reference to that at the bottom of the page. Uh, that came out in 2010, 2009, 2010, somewhere around that. Uh, and there was a major revision in 2014. All right. Now, I specifically put these two definitions on this slide because we see a reference to that. Where did I see that reference? Uh, I thought there was a reference to that in a previous slide, but maybe not. Um I, I try to, you'll notice that there are a lot of uh, kind of uh, red versus black uh, items in the slide here. 
anything that's a definition or something that I think is important to note uh, is typically documented in red there. So you can make note of that or whatnot. That's one of the major things about this particular exam is that there's a lot of a lot of stuff that that you need to to kind of you know burn into your brain or or at least uh, commit to memory uh, during the exam anyway. Uh, ISO, the International Organization of Standardization, 27001, uh, is another framework, uh, if you will, um, that allows us to define, you know, or, or at least provide guidance on how we're implementing security in our organization. Uh, this uh, ISO IEC standard, 27001, is an international standard, but it's also there to manage information security. Uh, it was uh, originally published jointly by two different organizations, the International Organization of Standardization and the International Electro, uh, oh gosh, IEC, International Electrotechnical Commission. Uh, and uh, the major revision came out in 2013. That's the colon 2013. I think the original version came out about the same time as publication 5853, uh, which was in 2005. Uh, but again, it, it establishes um, the requirements for implementing and maintaining uh, information security management systems within your organization. Uh, to make sure that you have secure assets. Uh, there is a European version of this as well. Uh, but this is a, a kind of a more general certification process. Um, oftentimes organizations, and it's certainly, uh, well, in a lot of cases, completely voluntary. Uh, but a lot of org organizations like to be able to publish that they meet a particular standard. That gives the um, uh, that gives the consumer uh, and the customers of that particular entity a confidence that the organization is operating uh, in a secure manner and that they are ISO certified, which means that they've been audited and and tested and verified to meet those particular standards. All right. Uh, so in ISO uh, 27001, it requires that uh, organizations kind of systematically examine their information security risks, uh, looking at different threats, vulnerabilities, impacts. They have to design and implement a comprehensive uh, set of controls, security controls uh, for risk treatment. Uh, and that can include risk avoidance and risk transfer as well to, to uh, address those risks that are high value, meaning unacceptable, uh, and then have an overarching management process uh, to make sure that the information security controls meet the organization's security needs uh, on an ongoing basis. All right. Now, again, you're not going to be required to know what's on this slide specifically, uh, but um, it is important to kind of understand how these frameworks relate to each other and so on. So I only did one example of this asset management. Uh, I don't believe I kind of broke down all of them. Let me see. Yeah, I did not. Uh, but you know, this is just an example of one control element. Remember, 18 families, 285 controls. So asset management, uh, which is uh, access control, awareness training, should be listed in here somewhere. But uh, asset management is just one small element. But um, it falls under uh, identify, right? Uh, the data, personnel, devices, systems, and facilities that enable an organization to achieve business purposes are identified and managed consistent with their relative importance to the business objectives and the organization's risk strategy. Uh, subcategory, 
physical devices and systems within an organization get inventoried. Uh, software platforms and applications within an organization are inventoried. Organizational communication and data flows are mapped. Um, we see the CRR reference, which is that cyber resilience review that we spoke about previously. We didn't talk about the risk maturity model. Uh, we might talk about that a little bit later on. Um, but again, you're not going to have to un, you know, say, okay, how does the CRR reference map over to the RRM, RMM reference? Uh, that's, the purpose here is to identify that a lot of these frameworks have the same elements, they include or incorporate the same components. All right, uh, so please don't get uh, too concerned about, oh my gosh, uh, I see all these numbers and these references and COVID-5 and CCS, CSC1 and, and ISA and, and NIST Special Publication 53. Um, these are certainly, you can cross-reference those documents and look at those sections but you're not going to have to know, you know, the 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 relative or the relationship between the different uh, frameworks. All right. Uh, the uh, process, for example, for 27,001 certification uh, is multiple stages. A preliminary stage uh, where we we check the uh, existence of documentation and so on. And then stage two is the compliance and audit stage. Uh, and then there's an ongoing maintenance component as well. Um, the controls that we put into place are going to include things like information security policies, uh, um, human resources security, asset management, access control, uh, there's going to be cryptographic function, cryptography, uh, physical and environmental security. When I think about physical, we're talking about uh, walls and gates and locks and, and environmental security, uh, HVAC systems and, envir and, and, and um, life safety systems, operational security, comms uh, security, system acquisition. Uh, how do we develop systems? What are our supplier relationships? Uh, information security, incident management. How do I manage incidents that occur within the organization? Um, business continuity management uh, and compliance uh, and monitoring, etc. cetera. Uh, you're already probably starting to see kind of all these different commonalities uh, based on these terms that I'm, I'm describing, all these different commonalities uh, uh, to these different frameworks. And we will continue to see that as we break down uh, the other uh, frameworks uh, that we go through in this, in this particular um, case. All right. So what is do care by definition? Oops. There we go. What is do care by definition? Uh, there there are two things that we define with regard to due care, uh, uh, well, regard to compliance, right? Due care versus due diligence, okay? Um, let me actually define due diligence first because it leads to due care. Uh, due diligence is a, a process in which you exercise care uh, that is what we would define as reasonable or normal expected behavior before you take an action, right? Uh, probably not the best way to define it, but basically it's what you do in advance to ensure compliance, to ensure safety, to ensure security, whatever it might be, all right? what we define as a preemptive measure to avoid harm. That's a really good definition of due diligence. Uh, background checks of employees, making sure if you hire a school bus driver uh, and you did not do a background check of that bus driver and that bus driver happened to be a uh, sexual deviant or a pervert, uh, which was documented through criminal uh, response or whatever, 
and you ended up hiring that person, you now have shown a lack of due diligence uh, and you could be held accountable uh, because you didn't take the appropriate steps to ensure that that particular person was suitable for that position. Credit checks of business partners, uh, anything that's proactive, right? Security system assessments, risk assessments, penetration testing, uh, contingency testing of backup systems. Uh, this is a big one, right? People have backups all the time, but they don't actually test and verify. And then when they need the, um, the information, they realize that their backup strategy was not adequate. Uh, threat intelligence services to check for intellectual property on the internet, uh, and so on. So by definition, due diligence is the process of preemptively taking action to reduce risk, to reduce harm, to reduce bad things from happening in the organization. The reason due diligence is so important is there's another term that we will describe later on, um, and, and I'll get into it later on, but is, is it, it limits the liability of the organization if they were acting uh, appropriately. So li the liability of the organization um, will, will depend on you know, what actions they've taken in advance and during operations. We'll talk about due care in a second. But uh, uh, what you take in, in um, what steps you take proactively uh, to manage risk in your organization or any type of vulnerability that an organization might have, right? Uh, and uh, do care, by definition, is what you do daily. You know, what, what tasks are you uh, uh, taking on a regular basis to, to act safely or reasonably. Uh, a perfect example that I like to use is uh, driving on the interstate. Yes, the speed limit is 65 miles an hour. Uh, and you can't simply say, if you get in a car accident and kill somebody, that because you were driving 65 miles an hour or 62 miles an hour, that you're not responsible. Because what if there's a storm the roads are wet or they're icy conditions or there's fog. You certainly can't drive 65 miles an hour in thick fog and not expect something negative to happen. So due care is an effort made by an ordinarily prudent or reasonable person to avoid harm to another by taking the circumstances into account. What is happening in my environment right now? Just because the speed limit is 65, doesn't mean that it's safe to go 65. All right. Uh, lack of due care is actionable. It's negligence. So just because you weren't necessarily breaking a law doesn't mean that you cannot be found negligent if you were uh, uh, found to be not acting with due care. All right. So the level of judgment, the care, the prudence, the determination, the activity, that a person, person would reasonably expect to do under any circumstance. This machine here doesn't have a sign that says no ties, right? So this guy putting his tie in the machine and pushing the button, even though there isn't a specific rule that says not to do that, it's not a reasonable action that you would take uh, typically, okay? So the care any reasonable person would use under any given circumstances. Uh, and it also describes, uh, from an organizational standpoint, their legal duty. All right. All right. We're wrapping up this 